Hello. Oh. Hello. <laughs> All right. Well, it is 5.03. I'd like to call to order the Education Operations Committee to whole of the Wausau School District uh, Board of Education. First item on our agenda is approval of the Ed Op minutes of February 25, 2019. Um, is there any comment, any questions? No. Nope, nothing more to add? All right. So I will uh, look for a motion to approve the, the minutes of the Ed Ops meeting of February 25th, 2019. So moved. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> and I abstain. Uh, the next item on the agenda, we're going we're gonna to skip the health insurance plan for the moment in the case that one more of our board members can get here and then we would have quorum for that issue. So we'll cover just very quickly the, the gifted and talented, and I don't cover very quickly, but we'll move on to the gifted and talented and we'll move on to the budget reconciliation since those are not action items and then we can come back to the health insurance and hopefully we'll have one more board member here. Just three of us are conflicted on that issue. So uh, let's begin with the uh, uh, gifted and talented strategic plan. How much room do you need? Well, um, we have four seats. We'll be like that. Right. Um, we have four seats. You'll give us ten. <coughs> Ninety-five. <laughs> Yeah. We're missing a couple of our members too, but we'll. Oh, you, that's okay. You can still go? Yes, sir. All right. We are thrilled to be first. Oh, flexible. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> when you call me, sir, you make me think I'm in trouble. I'm sorry. <laughs> Dr. Lee, would that be oh. done? <laughs> okay. Jeff's even better. Jeff's better. Okay. I'm Tammy Stepbauer. I'm the coordinator for the gifted and talented um, department for the Wassa School District, and I'm here with. All of my team, he snuck in. Um, four of our five GT Learning Resource teachers are here with me tonight, and if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourselves. Sure, I'm Heidi Hanner. I'm Cheryl Borda. Matt Adams. Aaron Bowler. One of my most important responsibilities is to work um, to oversee the work of the GT department. A second key aspect of my job is to work with the department to oversee the work of the district GT advisory <coughs> committee which includes our five-year strategic plan. All right, which button do I click? Um, just here. Oh, boy. Yes, okay. <laughs> Jeff. We have approached our advisory work with three goals in mind. We want to honor and respect the work that's already been done <coughs> at the advisory level, honor and respect the people who come to the table to do the work, and honor and respect people's time. Getting the right people to the table to, the, to do the right work will take us far, but this is not a fast process. Two years ago, we were asked to create a five-year strategic plan. We got to work on that right away, and we're actually in year two of implementation. This is you. <laughs> All right. Um, so the document you have, the Google Sheets document, uh, it's got six goal areas and 64 action steps. Uh, it's nice and neat now, but it started fairly messy. We had posters all over the room in here just writing down ideas that everyone was throwing out. Uh, we started by talking about the stuff that we've already been accomplishing over the past few years, and then moving on to what we wanted to be uh, over the course of the plan. Um, we, we had to think about personal goals, we had to think about everything that teachers already have on their plates, district initiatives, school initiatives, state initiatives. Um, so we had to look at it from all sorts of different aspects. Um, this slide up here has some of the things we've already accomplished as a GD department. We've done a whole lot and we obviously have a lot more to do. Uh, and it affects quite a bit more than just us, so it's that's why it's an advisory issue and not just a GT department issue. Yeah. That's me. Um, there are many factors that drive our work. Um, the law drives our work. The um, other colleagues drive our work. Our, our clients drive our work. <coughs> Ourselves, we drive our work because we always want to use best practices. Um, 
and we realize that we have some lofty goals. We also realize we're one department in a district with many departments, and we ask ourselves, is this reasonable? Is it reasonable for us to do? Is it reasonable to ask of our colleagues as well? We have um, six goal areas, and the best practice says you should probably stick to three to four. We just couldn't do it because so all six parts of these are so important to our, our, our department. Um, you will notice as, as you read through those goals, there's overlap. For instance, creativity has always been on our plate. We've tried so hard to get into that area because it's part of the law. But creativity requires us to look at curriculum. It re requires us to look at um, identification along with professional development. So you'll see that, that strand of creativity through quite a few of our goal areas. We also know that this has to be kind of a living, breathing document because every year something's put on our plate that was unexpected. Sometimes pretty, pretty challenging, I don't wanna say problems, but things that we need to, to address. And so we're, our goal is to stick to these timelines, but we know we might need to adjust. We also know we're gonna need help from a lot of different avenues from the district. So some big priorities for our department and advisory this year have been social emotional learning increasing communication, increasing resources, both for teachers and for parents, and of course, our five-year plan. Next year, a big priority will be PD on differentiation and creating a formal identification process for creativity, as Heidi mentioned. In addition to continuing to improve our communication with parents and secondary educators, as well as continuing to better support secondary students through Aaron Bowler's leadership and maintaining all the other aspects of our programming. And this says a lot, change moves at the speed of trust, and we have a lot of trust among the, the six of us on the, the six, five, and Tammy and Chris, and the team of seven, really. Uh, and uh, we, we rely on each other a lot, especially me coming in a year and a half ago. Uh, the, it's been invaluable how much I've been leaning on Heidi and Matt and Amy and Cheryl and Tammy and Chris, and, and uh, the, the seven of us have just, seems like we're moving mountains and, and doing a lot with, with uh, the resources we have. So if you can't tell, we're pretty proud of the work that's already been accomplished in the district. Whenever we've asked people to come to the GT Advisory Committee, which usually meets two and a half to three hours, three times a year, we've always been met with a resounding, yes, of course, I'll come to help. Um, some of the work for this strategic plan will need to be completed by the six, seven of us. Some of the work will need to be completed by various administrators and specialists, but the heart of the work will be completed by teachers, whether they're the gifted teachers or the classroom teachers. And we need to build capacity so that we can sustain all of these 64 action steps we are going to strive to complete. So if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. The African proverb up on the screen. And that's what we're all about at the advisory level, going together. Because we assemble uh, a room full of smart people looking at gifted education from a variety of lenses, not just the teacher lens, not just the coordinator lens, but parents, um, administrators. And you know, there's value in bringing that Hence, the reason it takes time to do anything when you put a room full of people who, um, you know, have a vested interest. Um, but in the end, you get a product, hopefully, that not only is um, good, but something we can actually accomplish. So I, I want to thank you because being supportive of gifted education is the highest compliment a school board could pay. Um, next, I'm going to ask you for your help and support as we navigate these action steps. Uh, we know we're going to need to make some adjustments. Um, as Heidi said, we're going to work really hard to meet our timelines. But as soon as we're sure we know what's on our plate, somebody else comes to dinner and we kind of shift gears. That's just how our work has been. You keep shuffling um, and shifting. 
but our ultimate goal is to support the district's mission to advance student learning, achievement, and success. And that's what we try our very best to do every day and um, will continue to do with, with this plan. Okay. Any questions? Thank you, Tim. Um, and thanks to everybody. The work that you guys do, I think I've talked to a few of you, continues to be uh, um, outstanding. And the response from the kids is over the top when you really get them engaged. Um, I guess my, my first question is, I'm, I'm not completely following what the actual strategic plan is, but let me start with, where is an example of a best practice GT program? within the state, within the country? Is there a, a model out there? That we always talk about Doctor Who and this person, that person who's come up and done these things a hundred times. Where could I get visibility into a model that's proven to work for GT learners? <laughs> Anybody want to tackle that, baby? Well, we go to Waytag every year looking for that, <coughs> that golden nugget. And there's so, like, we feel that in Nawasso, in Wisconsin, when we go to way tag, we feel we're way ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. um, it, that has to do with budget, do you agree? Yeah. Like what people are willing to spend. Um, but finding the absolute model, we have not found it yet. We've just found um, what are the best practices when working with gifted kids, how we, how we work it, how we structure it. We're still searching for the Holy Grail. On that. Okay. I can tell you in the literature, <clears throat> if you look, and I've, I was actually so pleased because one of the first WayTag uh, gifted conferences we went to, um, this presenter who's an author, she, and I'm not sure which city in Arizona, but she is in one of the urban um, districts in Arizona, Phoenix, they, Phoenix, they <laughs> tell themselves as the GT district. Mm -hmm. And because it's urban, they can, people are more mobile and they can grab kids. And this is a this is a PhD, accomplished author, um, nationwide speaker who's the gifted and talented coordinator for this school district. They have a GT teacher at every single building in the district, and they promote their own professional development within the district, again, because they've got, they've got the best as their coordinator. So I'm not trying to work myself out of a job, but when people... Um, I, I've had parents actually reference this district, and it's there's a reason there aren't a whole lot of districts and programs described as like what you're after, Pat, yeah. because there aren't a whole lot of them. And again, in this case, they've got they've got the guru as their leader, and well, they also have the funds. <laughs> yeah. They also have the funds, and they have the they have the means to draw students. You know, that's their thing. Yeah. And, okay. The, the funds, right? It, it always comes back, it seems like it always comes back to the funds. And I noticed in the 1920, one of the priorities for, for 2019 and 20 is increased resources, right? I, I don't recall. In fact, I think, Bob, the one request that we had for a GT teacher got whacked. Um, in the latest reconciliation. So <clears throat> where are the requests for the additional resources? Because I don't remember seeing any, and I'm curious, 19 is here, 20 is nine months away, yeah. and yet there's no ask for the resources. So well, where do we go? That's actually not true. Um, there's more resources than people. Um, sure. We have spent <coughs> one of those items, one of those <clears throat> things to dinner where you knock a bunch of other things out of the way, was we've been working with the Ed Department, and we're so fortunate that the GT department budget is what it is, but that doesn't really reflect right. the money that is spent <coughs> on gifted education. And so um, because of money set aside in the education department, uh, we've just, the team has just spent a couple months putting together and ordering resources. So um, our goal is to... So, so this is materials, books? Correct. Something? Yes. Because we, because we haven't been able to afford more people, we need to provide what we can to help our classroom teachers to meet some of the needs that we don't have the other GT resource mm -hmm. teachers to do. 
with their support, of course. So right. we're doing, you know, we're doing, I think, what we can. Um, and, and I guess that it, it still goes back to this, and I, I feel like I'm uh, beating the same ground for the last three or four years. When it comes to GT, it seems like we're always doing what we can, but yet I, I've never seen here's what we should be doing, mm -hmm. and here's the bridge from here to there. And I don't know how else to ask that question. I, it, it's literally, it's been one of the biggest frustrations for me <laughs> sitting on the board, is I, I don't understand what we don't have, and I don't even understand what I should be out there championing with, with constituents to say this is what we need, this is a direction we go. And, and I, I still don't see it, and, and that's not a knock against this plan or anything, and it maybe just my ignorance about the process. I, I still don't see what that five-year bridge looks like. Well, for, for example, we had a um, um, school counselor presentation to us once a couple of years ago, our social worker, and it, yeah. it started off huge. It was, and it ended up being half of, or even less of what the actual ask was initially, but at least we got to see <coughs> what the, boy, if, yeah. if we could have everything we wanted, this is what it would be. And now they didn't get it, you know, because other realities came into play. Um, but we got to see, you know, this was, and, and, and so maybe it's a little bit disheartening to take on a task to present to us something that you think you probably aren't going to get anyway. Um, but it was, it was good to be able to see that, that ask you know, this is what would be great if we could have this in every school. Yeah, and I think that goes back to what you said about being reasonable. You know, you, you can look around at the school and realize that you're not going to get everything you would ask for. So why ask if you're just going to be told no? Um, it's, it's very <clears throat> frustrating. Right, but if you're talking a five-year plan, right, you, you put that plan out there, here's what we would really like, mm -hmm. and in year one, it gets cut by 80%. Again, in year two, year three, the next thing you know, you're making incremental improvement to what you originally asked for. And that's no different than in, in the private sector. I mean, that's how things get done. That's how big initiatives get done. It's usually not a big bang. You have to put the stepping stones out there, secure the funds year after year, justify it, show the results. To me, that's the plan. That's a, um, a strategic planning process. That's how you follow up, follow through. You know, you're measuring your results. Yes, it's going to change left. It's going to change right because of you know all the things you said, and that's what I'm hoping we're going to get to. And I just don't feel that, and I, I don't know why. Giving the steps that you all have outlined, it, it sounds like there's a long way, and perhaps much more than five years, to get to defining what you would think would be your optimal program. It looks like you've got a lot of, you know, not only just 64 steps, but lots of steps along the way to figure out what the next steps ought to be. And so it might, you know, in this case, I don't know, is, is, is it possible to have that kind of a fully formed vision within a year or two or the outset of a strategic planning process? That, that, I mean, that, you know, that might be a bit more than, than could be managed. I, I think I know what you're asking for. Oh, I know what you're asking Good, for, because I'm too. not sure I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I think we all talk about that as mm -hmm. well, right? Where is the model that we should be striving for? And we've looked for it. We've asked for it. But it's it's not here in Wisconsin. Right. We know that. As far as Wisconsin, we have. We one have of the most probably one programs. of the top model programs with everything because we cover leadership, we cover cover performing right. arts, I mean, right. we keep adding, right? Um, I think was I don't know, but I think WASA has more <laughs> designated GT learning resource teachers, you know. Um, right. And, and, and that's, that's absolutely fantastic, and that's where I'm going, right? It's, you know, we've got five today, right, which is more than other schools, but to me that's like getting half the score, right? That's like saying Brewers, six, White Sox, because if you have five, what do you need? to really have the best model. Do you need eight? Do you need 20? I, that's the, the differentiator that I'm trying to understand. Same with technology, right? Is it resources? I remember that being an issue um, for Amy out at the team. They had to share some things or, you know, it, it just wasn't sequenced very good and they needed some additional hardware. So it, is that on a list somewhere? I mean, I, I just, I want to figure out what I should be advocating for and I still don't know that. 
what you said, Lance, <clears throat> is absolutely right. I, we can put together whatever you want, but I, I'm telling you that we are operating on all cylinders to do. Okay, we've got all we got these 64 steps we're going for. That doesn't include all the things that are already in motion. I, if you if you said you can have one teacher at every school, can I promise you that would be? I don't know because the fact is that we're bound by um, by schedules. For example, sure. So you could gift us with a, an, a GT teacher at every building. Would I keep them busy? I'm sure. Could I promise that we're gonna, you know, double the amount of face-to-face -face time they have with their students? Right. No, I I can't promise that. I. Okay. I, will. I want you to be excited about this. I, we really, really want you <laughs> to be I happy. Am. And because, again, I say that your support, look, it, there are breakout sessions where people <clears throat> are talking about how to get their school board on board. Mm -hmm. We don't have that. We have so, so many of the issues checked off of our list. Um, but, you know, you also know that I, I'm also serve in another capacity here and I I sit in staffing meetings where I know that the budget is tight mm -hmm. and I'm I don't take off the GT hat in those rooms I keep it there right but I ask myself the same question everyone is asked who are you gonna give up and I'm not giving up anybody I look to my colleagues they don't want to give up anybody or, or can't See, so it's, to me, that, that's the wrong question to be asking, which is a whole other discussion. It's not, who are you going to give up? What are the priorities? But if and we're going to balance start, our budget, uh, my priorities no, I, I are know. everything. I, my right. special ed, my gifted ed, my regular mm -hmm. ed, my recess. You know, it's right. so hard, Pat, because but, they're all priorities. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm going to switch. I love the program at the library and the, the art program and the psychedelic things that were in, in the fish tank room. It was wonderful. And the parents and the people that showed up. That was, that was great. I get a lot of parents telling me, and I don't know who to credit this with, with um, piano at summer school at Horace Mann. I don't know if they're at both or if that's where the, you know, the summer program is. But it's those kinds of things like Pat is asking for that they're getting exposure to. And the, he, the one grandfather said to me, my grandson didn't think it was cool to, to take piano, but he loves it. So I, I think that that's a way that we can get more kids in the arts exposed through summer school programs. And, and I think that you've done some things with robotics, right? Um, is that true? Or, or is that the high school people that are working on that? Okay. Uh, well, middle school it's, there's as well. Stem. It's high school, and yeah. it's. I am working to get it at a competitive level at both middle schools. Okay, yeah. and, and so I think that's important for the GT thing. And then, and I don't know all the right words, but when you have your, is it response to intervention, RTI? Mm -hmm. All right, and aren't you also working at getting gifted or um, acceleration kinds of things happening so it's not all remedial? And I think those are some of the things that the board would like to know. What, what's happening during those times? What are you doing for the kids? Because schedules are tight, but that would be a half an hour every day that they're getting something that is, is excelling their interest in something. And, and I know that everybody has ideas, but I think, and I don't think we do it anymore, but we used to do the listening project where certain music teachers in the elementary school after school would do listening projects to get kids to listen to music. Mm -hmm. And then they would do competition. But you know, when we talk about all the things on teachers' plates, you know, they're doing that out of the goodness of their heart. It, it would be great if those are some more things that we could incorporate during the day that kids could be doing that upper level music kind of things. And of course, my heart's in the elementary where I always think we get shortchanged when it comes to, you know, opportunities because they're little, I get that. You know, we used to have music in fifth grade, string. We don't have that anymore. We used to have so many things we don't have anymore, but I'm hoping that, you know, we can get some of those back. And I think that's what you'd like to know, the nitty-gritty. 
Well, you, well you know, yeah. No, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the nitty gritty is great, but and, and please l l let me just say this if it wasn't clear. I don't say this from a position of trying to be critical. I'm trying. You know, I'm your biggest fan, right? You guys know I love this program. I want to know what else I should be advocating <coughs> for because I, I want to fight to get you guys whatever you need, however we get it. So that's where I'm coming at this from because yeah. I think it's that important to this district. Well. Look, you have a fantastic program in this district. As I'm going back through binders from Steve Worman and Claudette Herring and um, former um, coordinators, people have been working hard for years here mm -hmm. to get right. um, the programming that's in place. And I mean, I don't know that I said this properly. You have the best team right here. Mm -hmm. You have, now for them I would like to have more teachers because they're, sure. they're maxed out. They're burning the candle at both ends, they're, you know, but you have the best people here who, who can deliver exactly what we need. Right. Um, and so I, I don't want to, I don't want to shortchange you guys either. I worry about them and what they can provide, but you have you have a great team right here. And I can tell you that at the state convention for school board and at, at the Waytay convention, they have programs often that address these issues. My kids were in school, I went to the Waytay convention, and it, it, even after I got on the board for a while, I went on my own dime um, because my kids were in that arena. And sometimes at the state convention, they'll have a program related to it. And it just, it it helps to seek this out sometimes. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, well, thank you all very much. And, and I hope you, you do realize that what you do is appreciated. And it's you know it's very important to the district as a whole, and and I hope you take the the, the, the commentary here as as sincere interest, and and uh, again not as a challenge, but but as, as yeah. us wanting to to be more involved and to know more. And so thank you again. Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda is the budget reconciliation plan. Uh, Bob, do you. Sure. Do you have anything more to share with us? Let me read between them here a little bit to we'll get <coughs> in the right order. Um, okay, I want to call your attention to a document that's in board book that looks pretty familiar. And when I talked to you at the last committee meeting, you were probably led to believe that tonight we were going to take action on this item. Uh, there are still quite a few things that are in flux at the state budget level. There are also some things that are in flux with our current staffing levels. Uh, so I felt perhaps one more look at it with a couple of changes uh, without taking action and then take action on this at the April committee meeting, May full board meeting, and then you'll be ready to see the full budget. It's first iteration, of course, of course, in May. To point out some things that have changed. Uh, aggregate health insurance premium increase went from eight in the assumptions to a seven at the last, it's back at eight. Because of how many of the savings we can capture through some of the changes we're recommending later tonight, that's back to where the original assumption of 8% health insurance premium changes. Doesn't mean every premium is gonna change 7%, we just need to generate 8% more in aggregate premiums. We're self-funded, so we, we get that from ourselves, so to speak, much of it, and some of it from our employees, 8%. The staffing reductions slash additions, there's some additions, there's some reductions, but the net is an increase in 2.5 staff. So we have a lot of data that suggests that we are adequately staffed as a district compared to our peers, and we're adding 2.5 staff right now. We really want that to be flat. We're going to try our hardest over the next three weeks to make that flat, and if we can make it flat, perhaps we can go back to this assumption, which we've targeted as probably priority number one, to increase the salary percent from 2% to maybe two and a quarter, two and a half, who knows what. And we're going to try to do that with keeping our staffing levels flat. 
Right now, the reconciliation plan has a plus 2.5. Probably the most significant difference is this one right here. The one-time elementary math curriculum expenditure that you saw in detail at the last committee meeting was a $600,000 one-time ask. And in the budget reconciliation plan, and also you got at this at your last committee meeting, how this is going to be a problem forever if we don't address it. But we're not capitalizing in our reconciliation plan from the one-time nature of that request. We're cutting $600,000, and we're cutting it in recurring expenses for a one-time expense, because we don't have one-time reductions that are that plentiful. So instead of a $600,000 one-time request, we're taking $150,000 from the current education budget. We're going to ask the education budget to shoulder $100,000 each of the next recurring years. We're going to pull $50,000 from fund balance. We're going to capitalize on better uh, negotiations with the one vendor that we, we did choose. Uh, reduce it by about $100,000. And what you see then is the same $600,000, but that $600,000 turns into a new budget request of only $200,000. $100,000 leverage better pricing, $50,000 <coughs> hit the fund balance, which I'm hoping you feel is a good investment. $100,000 from the education department forever, let's just call it. $150,000 from the current budget for the same math resources that we're going to get ordered real fast if you approve it. And this is what's most appealing probably. This is a curriculum savings account, we'll call it. More specifically, it's called defined fund balance. Well, defined fund balance define it for curriculum purchases, and that's 200, 400, 600. It grows 200 every year, and the next time we get a significant curriculum purchase, we'll be able to access that. Think Fund 46. Fund 46 is our long-term capital improvement plan, and there's legislation that allows us to get preferential aid treatment by doing that. We can't do it with curriculum necessarily, but we're going to take about the same approach. We're going to fund it with $100,000 which is going to be easy compared to the $600,000 request that we were looking at three weeks ago. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the good, it was a $600,000 request. We didn't really recognize the one-time nature of it. Now it became a $200,000 request. Much easier to reconcile our budget. So now you'll see a reconciliation plan that reflects that. Do we have some kind of cur big curriculum adoption like that just about every year? Or how often? Not the big ones. Maybe every three or four years. This is the second time since I've been here. Okay. We, we did. It, it, tends, it tends to be um, at the elementary level where we make the huge adoptions because mm -hmm. it has to cover every student K-5. Right. When you get to the middle school and the high school, um, you've got smaller pieces. Okay. And some of, some of the, our faculty have developed their own curriculum uh, through curriculum writing. And so we simply buy additional what, additional pieces to go along with it, sure. kind of like resources. Sure. So it's not, when you get to the secondary, it's not usually huge chunks like that. Okay. Well, then that makes perfect sense. Come on in, Lee. And the big change you'll see, this component used to be dark green. It was a one-time expense. And now it's light green. It's a recurring expense. 200 isn't recurring. Actually, only 100 is. 200, 100 is one time, 100 is recurring. I think that's a, a pretty good move. And think about helping the budget reconciliation plan by $400,000. And the staffing in particular reductions that aren't needed to be made. And we're still sit, sitting down here at $25,000 within a balanced budget. So you'll see this with maybe a little bit more definition, but it's pretty close to what you'll see a month from now, and you will be asked to take action on it. And I'm hoping the other thing that's going to change, the adjusted special ed categorical aid reimbursement from 24.5 to 27.5, I'm hoping for that to go to 30 because that's what's in the budget right now. And I'm hearing some support. We don't know what's going to happen, but uh, hope isn't alone a plan, but <laughs> I hope that changes. 
Well, think about that, that uh, across the district elementary ed book adoptions, that's a fairly new thing. We, we weren't doing that a number of years ago. Schools were doing their own individual thing, more like it's, it's done at the higher level. So that's, it's good that we have a process now for figuring out how to pay for those all at one time adoptions. And that uh, the $405,000 with uh, adjusted special ed category, that 3%, that's huge. Yeah. It's incredible. And if they can go up, that solves off so many of other, other of our problems. <coughs> The school budgets in Wisconsin aren't exactly set up to make multi-year purchases. It just isn't arranged that way. It makes it inconvenient. So you have to create your own opportunities. And the board, you've gotten comfortable with this over the last three or four years, passing unbalanced budgets. So you'll have a budget that's unbalanced. So in the year we're putting into that account, we'll have $100,000 of revenue that's not spent the next year $100,000 of revenue not being spent and then maybe three years we'll have 300000 or $400,000 mm -hmm. expenditures that were not revenue in that year because statutorily we have to pass a balance but pass a budget each year we don't pass a biennial budget it's not exactly set up so we have to create opportunities like this it's a great idea <clears throat> yeah appreciate the creativity mm -hmm. yeah. And no action tonight. Okay. Any uh, any questions? Additional comments? All right. Thank you very much, Bob. And great to see you, Lee, because we were short of uh, a quorum. of quorum for a couple of issues, and now we've got it. So uh, very glad that you could make it in. Um, and that leads us to go back to item three: the health insurance plan design changes. And three of us are conflicted on this. So. I turn it over to you, Beth. Thank you. I will invite a few people to come up to the front table. Uh, you might know John Price from M3 Insurance. Hi. Of course, Danny and Carla are on our own team. And there are many documents and board book. You might want to consult this one while we're talking. This is my memo that I created. I added to it since with a few emails answering some questions. Uh, but this captures all the process. It captures a lot of the plan changes that were being considered. It captures some of the plan changes that the committee is recommending. Uh, they're in chart form. We're going to recommend tonight uh, a couple of Pretty significant changes. One is uh, the selection of our third party administrator. We're making a recommendation tonight to select the third party administrator, Aspirus Arise, with the WPS network and the insurance com committee, who I'm going to reveal in a little while who was on that committee, made this as a unanimous decision. Uh, so there are also some plan design changes here that our selected third party administrator will help us uh, manage and get through and access to the right network. So with that, I'm gonna call your attention to a PowerPoint that is also in your packet. And throughout the evening, this is what we would like to accomplish in the next 15 or 20 minutes. And before going any further, I wanna acknowledge those on the insurance committee. These are the people on the insurance committee uh, John and Cindy are up there. They're the only two up there that are not district employees and the only two up there that don't participate in the health, in the health plan. Otherwise, we've got everybody up there, a variety of employee groups and some veterans and some not so much veterans and they all participate in the health plan. I don't know if anybody wants to admit that they're on that committee. I saw a couple people <laughs> earlier tonight. <laughs> Fun times, huh? Okay. And I want to compliment the people on the committee for a number of reasons. This is not an easy committee to be on. And you need to have a pretty decent understanding of healthcare industry and the insurance industry, both of which are pretty complicated. And we don't necessarily like to have a lot of turnover on this committee because you learn so much and you benefit from the intel of being on it for a number of years and where we've been and where we're going and what we tried already and don't want to do. And, and what we haven't tried and we might want to uh, attempt. 
And so I want to compliment the people on this committee for all the intel that they bring, all the while knowing that in some cases, they're going to be asked to recommend things that aren't necessarily popular, which is very difficult. But yet, our entire committee came together in the last year or so to bring the recommendation that you're seeing tonight, and it was with the support of the entire committee, which I think is very worth mentioning. That is difficult to get an entire committee uh, pulling in one direction. I think we did that. Uh, just a question on how this committee was formed. Um, did like an open invitation go out, or were individuals hand selected to serve on this committee? I wish I could answer that because this committee existed long before I got here. And as a matter of fact, Jeff Grass over and over said this is the longest standing committee in the district. And many of these members were on the committee when I got here. And I think it's probably a combination. Uh, people show interest and then are asked. Uh, it's a huge to... commitment. It is. It is. We meet monthly except in the summer. Uh, we're oftentimes talking about unpopular things, things that aren't interesting for some but are very interesting for us right uh you have the only one i can speak people? to is the food service because uh the person that was on the committee for a number of years did say i need to step back a uh, food service a leadership reached out to their employees to see who might be interested and they had a volunteer from that group uh, and we we did ask for the anybody on the committee to be a, a participant in the insurance plan because I had someone that really wanted to be on the group but was not on our insurance plan and we did feel like it was an important step moving forward that you know whoever's on the committee that they have a vested interest that they're not just there to give an opinion about something that doesn't affect them and so that but that's the only member that I can speak of just because of that circumstance. And I think you'll notice, too, how cross-functional the team is. Uh, we wanted to be sure that we had somebody uh, as a representative from each employee group. And I want to thank the committee also for the active work they've done over the last seven years. Aside from the chart in the upper right, this is a slide you have seen before. You have seen this before. It's from the Committee of the Whole, August 27, 2018. It is nothing short of amazing what the committee, administration, SAS, school board has done over the last seven years to accomplish zero premium changes for seven years. If we think about the eighth year up there, which is the one we're in the midst of, that's a 4% increase. The one we're talking about right now, if we consider premium increases along with plan design changes, about 18% change. So if you wanted to take that 18 and 4 and extend it over the 10 years you're seeing up there, or the 9 plus this year, it'd be about a 2.3% increase each year. Either a premium increase, plan design change, or a combination of the two. 2.3, 2.3, 2.3, 2.3. And when you live that long under the trend line, you know something's going to give. We've talked about that for many years. As long as I've been here, we've talked about that. Something's eventually going to give. Our premiums are going to go up. Our plan might need to change. And the committee has done a fabulous job over the years of managing fund balance. There were three years, maybe even four years, where we took considerable draws from fund balance. One year, I believe it was a million dollars. Take a million dollars from fund balance and allow the premiums to stay flat and no plan changes. And although our auditors helped us make that decision, our auditors said your fund balance is getting too big, we also used the logic that the people that are currently participating in the plan generated the fund balance, they should benefit from it. So we kept it flat and drew from fund balance. Kept it flat, drew from fund balance. Even the year that we're in the midst of, 4% premium increase. That's actually an 8% premium increase because we drew down fund balance $600,000. We're not at the point right now where we can continue to draw down fund balance to protect our employees and protect the district from premium increases and in plan changes. Up on top, this is if you took the full family network choice premium and you considered 15% of it, these are actual 15% employee contributions to the health plan. 3,400, 3,400, 3,400. And then this year it finally went up 4%. 
If you consider 6% trend, which is what we're using going forward, going back we used 8, but if we just talk about 6% trend, employee contribution, 34, 36, 38, it goes all the way up to 5,400. Those were the employee contributions that were averted by active plan designed uh, uh, management, drawing from fund balance, an active wellness committee that keeps people healthy and keeps claims down. That's quite impressive when you think about it. Again, a slide you have seen before, and that created opportunity. From what we actually did, 000, to what the trend could have been, ironically at the same time that Act 10 happened. And Act 10 happened right around here. And we're no longer obligated, nor can we, negotiate health benefits. But look what has happened. Hardly no plan design changes. Arguably we made one improvement in that stretch because we had a high deductible choice with a $2,000 contribution to the HSA. <coughs> we also brought in a significant wellness benefit, $800 per family, $400 for single. Both of those things happened during that stretch following Act 10. And then a 4% increase and then what we're talking about today which we'll call an 18% increase. It's 8% premium increase, 10% plan design changes. And the committee quickly became aware. That's tough to come up with a number like 18% mm -hmm. without just raising the premiums 18%. It was necessary to do some of the things we did. Here's another slide that you have seen before. This one was in November of 2017 when we pulled $600,000 from fund balance and we allowed premiums to go up 4%. Those were the changes that year, and this is an actual slide. We talked about increasing the deductible. It may need to happen sooner versus later. Narrow network. We talked about that in a public meeting. Increase employee contribution. We didn't increase the percent, but the actual employee contribution because the premiums went up. Uh, change office and prescription copays. We talked about that a year and a half ago. Here's another one we talked about six months ago in November. 8% premium increase is what we're projecting for next year. And we tried to make people as aware as we could without taking it away from the board seeing it first. We feel very strongly that the board has the right to see some of these things first. We're not in the, in the middle of a big communications campaign. Our communication campaign is getting you to understand these benefits so you can and these benefit changes so you can make an informed decision. But we did at least hint that we were going to change the deductible, narrow network considerations, which in November we were in the midst of talking about with our committee, increase employee premium contributions, co-insurance considerations, change office and RX co-pays, introduce a four-tier drug plan. All of those things we were talking about with the committee already in November and I was bringing to the board's attention. I'm going to turn it over to John now, John Price, is going to be able to better highlight than me some uh, numbers that they used and we used to arrive at the current uh, renewal. Thanks, Bob. Um, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Fine. Mm -hmm. So what I want to do is walk through how we arrived at an 18% number um, because M3 doesn't, you know, uh, pull these out of the sky. If we did, we'd pull a much lower number. We have an underwriting team who's met with the district many times and we've gone over the finances together, but I think it's important to talk about how you get there. Because when you have that kind of an increase, if I'm a school board member, I guess I would like to know. You know, how, how do we talk, we're talking about a 18, 19 million dollar benefit that could go up to, to 20 million, uh, 22 million, depending on the decisions we make now, and talking about how we got here and why we would project that kind of an increase is important, we thought. If you look at um, the current, the most recent plan year, medical paid claims were, paid claims were $17,213,719. The prior time period was $15,692,739. Um, prescription drug claims were $3.3 million for the most recent year. 3051000 for the prior year. This part gets a little confusing, but we do throw out high-cost claims that are paid for by a stop-loss carrier. 
because if you're not paying for them, let's not pretend that you're going to be paying for them going forward. Let's take them out of the equation. We shouldn't, that would make the renewal, if we didn't pull those out, it would make the renewal even higher. So to be fair, our underwriters pull out claims that are over $200,000. What we also do is adjust for some plan design changes that you've made. You've had to make some minor tweaks because high deductible health plan in particular required you to increase the deductible per federal law. So those minor changes are adjust, uh, adjusted to arrive at paid claims then. Paid claims are $19,633,000 and $17,444,000 over the last two years. You can see that the most current year is much higher at 19 0.6 versus 17.4. When you have $2 million more in claims for the most recent time period, that is alarming to us. It, it has been somewhat alarming to the group. It is something where we start to say, hey, listen, we probably should start to, to tweak the things that we've talked about for the last two years. Let's talk about how we can improve that. We, we feel we have an obligation to help the district to find a way to do that. Before we do that, however, we need to make sure that we think it's going to be $19.6 million yes, next year, and we don't. And the reason we don't is we need to use medical inflation. We need to look at the fact that costs are going up every single month. Arguably, some say they're going up every month by half a percent. Might be less than that, might be more. If that were the case, that'd be 6% per year. How could that be? Well. It's just what we're seeing, unfortunately. Aging population, increased pharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. increased utilization. We're, we're seeing uh, a lot more technology. When you go in, it does go up that much per month. So we have to trend the medical claims forward. We have to say, what do we think the claims will be next year? Because what they are now isn't as relevant. When we do that, we still don't think it's right to use 100% of this year's claims. It's too short of a time period. So underwriting methodology uniformly in our industry, we, we see every underwriter do this. We're gonna take 70% of the current year, we're gonna take 30% of the prior year, and we're gonna blend those two together to come up with projected future costs. We believe that your projected future costs will be $19,977 per employee for the upcoming plan year if you don't make any changes. So um, what does that mean per year? Well, you have 1,064 employees on the plan. If you have 1,064 contracts, which you do, and you multiply it times 19,977 for each contract, we arrive at $21,255,000. We have to add your fixed costs to that at $1.5 You're paying for stop loss. You're paying a TPA administrator. You're paying for um, claims management, medical management, utilization management, disease management. All of that gets built into the 1.5 million. We arrive at total expenditures for the upcoming plan year at $22,793,000. Where you're currently funded at, you would be funding $19,216,000 currently. So the difference between those two numbers is 18.6%. Our underwriting department believes that you would spend 22.7 million, 22 million if you did nothing, where you're currently at is 19.2 million is what we're, sort of what we're planning on. So that kind of 18.6% increase was too high. And as such, the district, using the insurance committee, debated or deliberated, I should say, and it was significant deliberation with a great committee. And I'm glad that at least one of them is willing to admit that they're on the committee here. But we, we've had really a great committee, and they have agreed on changes that they would prefer not to make. They would rather say, let's not make any changes. But in, in anticipation that changes would eventually be necessary, it's something that the committee has been talking about for over two years. We've been meeting with them um, over the course of, of a longer period of time than that. But the last two years, the discussion has primarily been about what's out there. How can we make changes to offset future increases? And if we were ever required to make those changes, what would they be? The decision was made in the fall of 2018 to conduct a request for proposal. What happened was the insurance committee had key findings that were a result of that proposal. Here's, here's what they are. Number one, they found that the plan design that you currently have is not surprisingly outdated. When that many years goes by without changes, you know, education 
even has changes in plan design over the course of many years. And what we're seeing in education is no longer aligned with what you have. Number two, what the committee uh, determined was it's true, mergers and acquisitions in healthcare, the Affordable Care Act, TPA networks, sorry to get into industry jargon, but doctors, hospitals, and clinics are really aligning in different ways. I think a great example of that is the fact that Aspirus bought an insurance company. That's a pretty big change in this community. When you have so much care going to Aspirus, for them to buy an insurance company, what it might mean is you need at least want to examine whether or not you could get a better deal buying from a provider system like Aspirus, a multi-specialty local clinic with a hospital, where 70% of your claims are coming from, and saying, how much better could we do if we looked at continuing to steer people there, but with a better contract? Arguably, the first question people ask is, yes, but is it a better contract? And we'll get to that in a minute. The other thing that was looked at was plan design and provider network changes in order to better manage costs and keep benefits strong. How can we make the changes that are the least disruptive was talked about at length. So when, when the committee makes the claim, um, it, to some extent, obviously with help, I mean, um, you know, they're, 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 they're saying it's not aligned with what we see in education. And when we look at education, what we see is the average deductible in the state of Wisconsin for a single employee is $1,908. On the traditional plan, which is currently called the network choice plan, it'll probably be changed to be called the traditional plan, because it's a very sort of outdated, older type plan that we, we still see out there. You have a $300 deductible. So the average is $1,900 for single, yours is three. We see that the newer plan that the district is offering is a high deductible health plan offered in conjunction with a health savings account. And you know, it's a, a very good benefit because there de there's a deposit that Bob mentioned earlier that goes into the health savings account for employees. Granted, it's a $1,350 deductible, but a deposit is made into most employees' account, particularly full-time employees, that gives them $1,000 towards that $1,350 deductible. So it's a very generous benefit. Nothing wrong with that. It's a good thing your benefits are strong, and I believe the intent of the committee is to keep your benefits strong. What was also looked at is in education, 65% of the employer groups in this state that we work with, and we work with more than half the school districts at M3, we're seeing that they offer some form of coinsurance. What is coinsurance? Well, instead of after your deductible being satisfying, saying all covered services are paid at 100%, it says covered services are paid at maybe 90% up to a maximum out of pocket. So that's a very common thing to do, and it's it's, it's in more plans than not in education, so that was something the committee looked at. Out-of-pocket costs for co-insurance right now are zero. The average is 2,079. What's being proposed here, if you read the documents, is a $2,000 out-of-pocket cost for co-insurance. Office visit co-payments right now are either $35 or $15, depending on you know uh, which plan you're on. And what's being proposed is $20, $20.05 was the average. ER co-pays are $169.20. Yours is at 100, there's no proposed changes there. Prescription drug coverage has co-pays of 5, 15, and 30 uh, for the network choice plan for most employees. And, and we thought, you know, the average there is 11, 34, and 61. So there are some proposed changes, changing it to 5, 20, and 40. 5, 20, and 40 is still lower than what we see for the average in terms of co-pays. However, specialty medications are 25%. In terms of employer contribution, how much is paid out of the employee's paycheck? Employees are paying on average in education 14% of the premium. You know, your employees are paying 15% of the premium, so there's not much of a difference. It's just about a wash if you're looking at a full-time employee. And maybe offsets a little bit the fact that your deductible has and will continue to be a better deductible if all of these changes are agreed upon for this evening. So going back to the RFP, when, when that's looked at, the averages, and you're starting to look at, okay, we sent a request for a proposal to only those entities that could offer unique network arrangements. Of course, security administrative services would be considered. They're a strong partner and a long-standing partner of the district, but also analyzed was UMR 
large TPA or third party administrator. Some people would know them like as an insurance company here in, in Wausau. They're domiciled here in Wausau. How could you not look at them? The largest TPA in the United States happens to be here in Wausau, Wisconsin. It makes sense to look at them. Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield was analyzed along with Aspirus Arise who partners with WPS and Oxiant. When those entities were asked to, to return a proposal, in a relatively short amount of time, we were very impressed with the fact that even though the request for proposal was sent out in December, they appropriately responded back on time in January as scheduled. The insurance committee reviewed them and they decided to conduct finalist presentations in February 2019. The criteria used to determine who the finalists would be, the criteria was cost, network value and discounts, service, reporting, market innovation, and overall savings potential. Interviews with the finalists uncovered a percentage reduction off of the renewal if narrow networks were offered, but changes to the plan would still be necessary. The two entities that were chosen as finalists were your current third-party administrator being Security Administrative Services, which is wholly owned by Marshfield Clinic. The reason why they were considered was, you can see that if an the entire district went to a narrow network featuring Marshfield Clinic, there would be a 9% savings or roughly $2 million. If you did the same thing with Aspirus and they own Aspirus Arise, Ironically, our underwriters arrived at the same number, a 9% reduction, $2 million by offering Aspirus. When we looked at UMR, we were disappointed to find that the network they used, which is the Northern Employer Health Alliance Network, only produced 4% savings or $800,000 in savings. Oxian, same thing. It left, we feel, the committee almost no choice but financially to more strongly consider the remaining two. What they learned was as a result of doing the interviews, 17 of the top 25 providers were, are in network with Aspirus Arise based on your current utilization. So where your employees are currently going is more often Aspirus, compared with just seven in network for the um, other plan, which is Security Administrative Services, narrow network featuring Marshfield Clinic and Ascension. It was also uncovered that 70% of the district's claim dollars are spent at Aspirus. That's quite a bit more than anyone else. In looking at the numbers, I mean, it was startling to find that 8.4% of your Aspirus charges, um, or $8.4 million was charged, and that's just on the hospital. When you look at the clinic, it's another 1.8. Significant. Where Marshfield Clinic was at 5.2. So it just, the data started to point in that direction. Additionally, what occurred at that meeting, which has since been corrected, um, is that Security Administrative Services notified the committee on the day of the presentation that claims for non-Security Administrative Services narrow network would not be covered other than for urgent care, emergent care. At our, I don't want to use the word begging, but we did spend a great deal of time getting them to understand that employees need to be able to go other places. Uh, certainly, it would be important if you had a dependent student, if you had a retiree, if you were traveling, if you just wanted to choose to go outside the network, having some out of network should be allowed. The committee was informed that they wouldn't have such coverage with that particular uh, TPA, which is Security Administrative Services. Since then, that has changed. On March 7th, we were notified that they'll allow it, but it didn't change the fact that 17 of the top 25 providers are still at Aspirus Arise and there were a number of other unique things which we can talk about that, for, that I don't want to say forced, but caused the community to more seriously consider Aspirus Arise, which would mean a change in TPAs. And we think that's a big change, by the way. Even, even we do. We, we, don't think, we don't take that lightly. Um, it's been a very good relationship with Security Administrative Services and one that we've appreciated and we know employees have. It's a big change. But the, a lot of talk about it, a lot of they were like, stayed later than we wanted to and didn't have pizza for the committee. And, and still continue to talk about it. Step one of making this change would be to make plan design changes that offset increases that closer align the district with the plan structure, which we've provided in, in your handout, and you can review or we can talk about. But basically, it's an increase in your deductible. It requires people who want the low deductible to choose the narrow network. People on the high deductible have a choice of going wherever they want. So there are <coughs> many things about it that we think were well thought out by the committee. 
other thing that was looked at was offering uh, the low deductible as narrow network uh, only, as I mentioned, but featuring Aspirus as Rise community network for both the, the traditional plan as well as the high deductible health plan. It made sense to continue offering the high deductible health plan with an HSA, um, a plan that offers employees choice, and that plan uses the WPS broad network, network which includes Marshfield Clinic and Ascension. So if I'm an employee that says, I continue to use Marshfield Clinic and I want to, our response to that employee is, and you should. They're out of network if you choose the low deductible, but they're still covered. And if you want, you can look at the high deductible health plan, which has a significant deposit into your HSA and still allows you to be in network using Marshfield Clinic. And, and that choice is a wonderful thing because the committee's decision on that means that no employees are forced to say, I can't go to Marshfield anymore or I can't go to Ascension anymore. We didn't, the, the committee didn't want that. And, and I think that was a great decision. Um, the part now that's most important would be to conduct intensive employee education to ensure understanding. You know, I, I can't tell you how many committee members, including long-standing teachers on the committee, um, you, you know, had told us, uh, you know, please make sure that we, we give employees a chance to understand this. And I'm proud that they did that. In order to do that, what would happen is, if all the changes were approved, Aspirus Arrive would provide a welcome center, a process to engage employees in large and small group settings. Uh, a, we call them a nurse navigator. I think they might have a different title for that. But it's uh, an on-site assist as it relates to employees with questions. It gives employees a lot of access, including clinical access to medical professionals rather just, than just insurance professionals. That's really neat. In addition, we will offer electronic and video communications as we always do There'll be written uh, educational opportunities. So if someone wants to read email, they can. But if they prefer to come to the meeting, they can. If they per prefer to look at a, you know, audio visual, they can. That, in order to happen realistically, would need to start happening very soon. We would prefer to start doing that in April and May so that when employees go out for the summer, they have a, new, a really good idea of what their new plan would be. And, and that's pretty much it. I, I hope it wasn't uh, belabored. I think there's a lot of important stuff in there. We wanted to make sure that you got a chance to see it. Are there any questions? I think you laid it out very clearly. It, it's obvious that the committee's process was very complete. <laughs> I have some questions about communication. Um, I've heard from a number of concerned individuals about feeling very much uninformed. Getting an email at the close of business on Friday, bad news is coming, we're going to have these changes, and um, they have not heard anything about it. So my question is, is this something that we can allow employees some time to learn about this I feel like we're putting the cart before the horse and we should allow those that are being affected by this the opportunity to weigh in I know that you said that uh, you think that the committee is well represented but I've heard from I see there's two teachers on there and um, I don't envy their their position on there I think they probably did a fantastic job but I've heard from far more than two teachers already concerned about this and one of the concerns was we don't know anything about this. We, we have thoughts about this. We want to have an opportunity to express our, our feelings on this. Um, and so I'm wondering, is there, is there urgency? Or can we give some opportunity for that? Sure. There is urgency. And one thing we struggle with, with many decisions that we ask you to make, in a variety of settings in this building, we want you to hear it from us oftentimes before anybody else does. And a communication plan that gets it to anybody first before you hear it and make a decision might A, put others in front of you, and B, could ask us to spend some time developing a communication plan that never happens because we don't know if you're in support of it. So we talk about it a lot. Very seldom do we like to bring things to others before you. And in this case, it did happen pretty quickly. Uh, the committee and 
administration, to be quite honest, and the board kind of knew these things were going to happen from the slides I showed before, but we did, really didn't know the ones that we were going to pick until February? February 27th. February 27th. Uh, we surveyed our committee in December. We talked about them after breaks. So we talked about them in January. We didn't know which TPA would be selected, so we didn't know which one of the choices we could really leverage. So February 27th, and we had March 18th on our calendar for quite a while. We said if we're going to back map for opening it up to employees to really understand, to make an open enrollment decision in May, for a plan change that happens in July, July 1st, we wanted to get this event to happen. Uh, so it did happen pretty quickly. February 27th, the committee really found out what we were going to do. And some committee members talked to their constituent groups more than others. Uh, we didn't uh, issue a gag order or anything like that. I've been parts of committees where we look around and say, don't tell anybody about this until it happens. We didn't do that. And some committee members shared more than others. Uh, I'm in front of the board saying these things are coming, coinsurance, higher deductible, narrow network considerations. Uh, I understand exactly what you're saying. We really, we, the real work is going to start after the board makes a decision because communicating the changes, educating our employees, some don't even know what coinsurance is. They don't have coinsurance. Uh, some don't understand the implication of choosing a narrow network and what happens when I have students in college in Madison. And we're talking about all those things and we're scribbling down some communication uh, strategies. We're probably going to talk about more seriously tomorrow if this goes through. But we certainly acknowledge what you're talking about. Uh, but we wanted to, we, we feel the board has the right to see that first. And right. it can be but, confusing. Well, um, on the one hand, you know, I'm hearing that this happened very quickly, but on the other hand, during the presentation, there was reference to uh, this has been an ongoing discussion for two years. And I understand that changes need to happen to remain sustainable. And I think, I think. That will be um, understood if the messaging is done appropriately. Um, I think that it just this might feel like it's out of the blue if that hasn't been communicated in the last two years. And as you mentioned, mm -hmm. some individuals might be going back and say, "Hey, you know, it's being talked about at board meetings as we have been mm -hmm. doing," but um, I think others are feeling like this is just completely out of the blue. Something we're up against, and maybe John can reflect on what the insurance industry says about this or the healthcare industry, but each year we go through a very uh, anxious stretch of months where we see our claims data building and then maybe it flattens out. And the longer you can wait, the better off you are because there's more claims data that you can use. And we waited and it didn't change and the next month it got worse. So you've got two or three months during this renewal stretch where you really have to pull the trigger on some difficult changes. And think about how those three or four months unfolded for many years in a row, as long as I've been here. We're looking at claims data in December. Wow, it looks pretty good. I wonder if we can continue one more month. Looks pretty good in January. In February, M3 comes to us with a 10% increase, and we resist saying we've got fund balance. Let's let fund balance take a hit. But every year we go through three or four months during renewal where it is very anxious. And you have to act on claims data, and claims data is fresh. And that's the good thing about being self-funded. Right? Self-funded. We can make changes and see immediate impact on our claims data. But we're using as much claims data as we can, so we're holding off as long as we can to have the most data. But we want to make our decision early because we want to inform people and get them in the middle of this decision so those are the challenges that we're left with. Well, I can tell you, when I first got on the board many years ago, the um, process for this was, you know, because we were not self-insured yet, um, self-funded, the insurance company would come to us say, and say, we're going up by 12% this year. And I naively asked my first year on the board, well, what did we counter with? And it was like, we don't counter. They just tell us and we take it in the neck. But I can tell you every year that goes by, I cannot wait until we go to national health care because this is death by a thousand cuts. Every year we, 
we make the program change, and that means that we're going to have employees that while technically they are insured, they will not be able to afford to use that insurance. And I just, it just makes me cringe and it makes me really upset and it makes me very sad. Well, the cost of health insurance and health care is a nationwide topic of discussion all the time. So whether or not we said in the Wasa School District or foreshadowed this with every employee, people are aware that health insurance costs are going up. And it's amazing that we were able to keep them at 0% increases for as long. The other thing I've noticed here is that even with these changes, and change is really hard for people, it seems like there's still a lot of choice that was one of your um, priorities. And I think the most difficult part of that change is knowing how the change is going to affect an individual. So when they get the chance to learn a little bit more about it, and then also look at all the choices and see maybe even one-on-one -on -one counseling, okay, which of these plans is going to fit my current situation the best and which one is going to be the most affordable for me, then some of that anxiety, I think, is going to be quelled. Mm -hmm. I think we really need to thank the committee that worked on this. They, they were obviously very diligent and they should considered every option that they could. They've done the best they can hold things down and I think that just really need to be thanked and really that has to be communicated that there's been a lot of research here to get us to this point. Mm -hmm. Can I add one thing? Yeah. There's going to be an open enrollment and that's the one, the urgent one, and we'll have uh, education before that point. Um, then for the education won't stop because there'll be half the changes are happening in January. So we'll have six months of being able to educate them on co-insurance and deductibles and how a few other changes on January happen. So it's not going to be just educating between now and May 15th when enrollment has to end and that's it. But it's going to be another opportunity to learn between now and November and have another open enrollment period for January 1st. I just want to make sure. And being the old historian on the board, and I was here when um, the, these things were negotiated, um, the insurance company never brought it until it was time to adopt the contract. And they would just present it. This is the best we can do. And as I heard your presentation and all the work the committee's done, this is the best we can do. So likely, I thank you for all your work. And it's just not fun. Um, it, and it's not something that we can say, well, we're going to ignore it and not do it. So exactly, it's, I, I just, you know, I remember what it was like. And first time the teachers would get it was presented is at the annual um, meeting. And we would, the committee that many of the members are the same people say, this is, this is not negotiable. This is what we have, period. So thank yeah, I, you for all your work. I don't want the committee to think that I'm, Done in you. I understand you have done the best with the barrel of rotten apples that we have. Um, it's it's just on the global scale when I see what other countries are doing and what we're doing to our employees. I just my heart so, breaks. Bob, we sort of had a destination plan. Like if two people were working and one of them was a Wasa School District employee, the family tended to go on to the Wasa School District health insurance plan because it was better. Um, with these changes, do you still see that being the case? Because it still seems like some of our deductibles and things are below the average for other plans. Yes, I do see it as the case. I mean, if we look at this, I think we, we talked about that quite frequently with our mm -hmm. committee. We wanted to still have a strong plan. It's the one thing that when we survey employees, they say we have a strong plan. And we love to be able to hang our hat on that. We don't want to make it weak to the point where it's not considered strong. Is it less generous? Probably, considering these changes. Mm -hmm. But you'll still see, even in education, it's better than average. Uh, if you go outside of education, these numbers get worse. Well, they sure do. You can talk to mm -hmm. relatives and friends and ask them what their plan is all about, and you'll see it's a pretty attractive plan. 
Mm -hmm. That was always the, the payoff for public employees. The pay might not be as well as the private sector, but you always had better benefits. And we, it has been chipped away at, but we still have a better plan. And there are companies that force their employees. If your spouse has a different insurance plan, you have to take it. You cannot take ours. So some of that won't change because they don't have a choice through their employer. Well, the other part of it is they're, they're the taxpayers, too. And I think we have to really demonstrate that we're being responsible in what we're looking at. Right. Exactly. Okay, is there a motion? Any, any other questions or comments? Then I would... No, I do have questions. Um, so, Bob, I'm looking here. I saw a $4,000 number. I don't know if it was in our in emails yep. or can you refresh I'll my help memory? You perhaps. I'm gonna call up another screen and it's the narrative document that you see where all the high, all the changes are highlighted. And it has to do with coinsurance. And that coinsurance out of pocket will max out at four thousand dollars. So that means if you've got a high deductible plan over here and a traditional plan over here, the traditional plan will have low exposure on the deductible, but a little bit higher exposure on the co-insurance because it'll go up to $4,000. So if they have a $1,000 deductible, they'll meet the $1,000 deductible, and then a lot of 10% to get up to $4,000. The high deductible plan will start already with a high deductible. So more exposure on the deductible but less exposure on the coinsurance because to get from 3,000 to 4,000, it's not as many tens. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So in both cases, it would be a $4,000 out of pocket max with regards to the coinsurance, which is 10, 10, 10. Okay, and so how is that different from what it currently is? I'm currently, to after you meet the your deductible, there's 0% coinsurance. So after you meet your deductible, you've met your deductible. Okay. We still think that, especially the high deductible plan, is still very attractive in sure. that, let's say it's $3,000 deductible, and then 10%, that takes another ten th another $1,000. You get up to four, but you're being offered $2,000. So we still think there's a pretty attractive plan out there, and that's also the one that offers the broad network. So, but that's how the, the $4,000 coinsurance, along with deductible, works. That's. That's where a lot of communication, a lot of education is going to have to be done. We're going to have to get out person to person, websites, print, YouTube, charts, graphs, one on one. Mm -hmm. and to, to explain some of those things when a person doesn't live in a co insurance world, mm -hmm. it's tough. So, does that mean um, we could, hypothetically, a person could see an increase from they were paying $600 under the current plan, and that could now change to 4000 Yes. Or if they had the high deductible, they were paying 2700 and that could change to 4000 Yes. And, and we talked often about changes that are across the board, everybody's going to share the burden. Premium increases do that. Whether you're using the plan or not, you're going to get an 8% aggregate increase. Then we talked about plan changes that hit higher users more than others. Mm -hmm. And then we talked about, I think I mentioned the phrase a few weeks ago, it's not a cost shift, but a convenience shift. Mm -hmm. Don't forget there are convenience shifts too. If you were going to Marshall Clinic in the past and you want to go to Aspirus, that's not a cost shift necessarily. That could come with it significant cost savings, but it's a convenience shift. So we think we have equal parts share the burden by everybody, share the burden by those who are higher users, deductibles do that, coinsurance does that, four-tier drug card does that, and then there are convenience shifts. And maybe convenience isn't the right word because it's not always convenience why you're choosing a doctor. People are pretty personal about that. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm in neither one of these networks because I'm Ascension, so. So, Bob, forgive me, um, any time that you explain it, I'm always following along and it's, it's wonderful. And then I leave and I have to try to explain what I heard from you and I want to make sure that I don't get it wrong. But I can already anticipate, because it's a question I did receive, how, how do we go from $600 to $4,000? And the concerns were 
that is just such a, a massive increase, I don't understand that. So I have a feeling that that's, I mean, that's part of the education that's going to have to happen. So how are you, I know you just explained it, but just. Uh, keeping in mind, to get from 1,000 to 4,000, <coughs> you have to accumulate 30,000 of additional 10%. You're going to have so most people will never claims, get there. Right? A lot of people will never get there. Many won't, point. but some will, right? Mm -hmm. And again, that's the focus on the high users. The high utilization will come with a higher cost. And during our communication slash education campaign, if that is what makes you nervous, maybe the high deductible plan is is right for you, and we're maintaining that that choice to still be able to choose a high deductible plan, mm -hmm. where now you're going from three thousand to four thousand. You're saying, well, that's still $4,000, but we're offering you $2,000 in HSA. Mm -hmm. And perhaps if you go from a traditional plan to a high deductible plan, it might come along with, <laughs> even though premiums are all going up, a premium savings too. Because instead of a traditional plan that's met with a high premium, it would be a high deductible plan with a lower premium. So we've got to make sure people understand how to choose the plan that's right for them. Mm -hmm. We're not saying it's not going to come with cost increases. Mm -hmm. We're $2 million underfunded. And how we capture that, we're capturing of the 18%, 8% with premium increases. And trust me, the, the burden is on the district too, right? 85% of that is our own budget. And we right. can't just up it to whatever without <clears throat> cutting programs and things like that. But 8% premium increase, 10% with plan design changes. So that 10%, some of it cost savings because of the narrow network, but some of it costs shift to employees. Mm -hmm. It's really undeniable. You can't really escape that, I don't think. And we keep on asking ourselves this question, if not this, what? Well, we've asked ourselves that question for a couple of years now. Do we want to force everybody to the high deductible plan? Well, if we go to a narrow network, we really want to maintain choice. Uh, do we want everybody to go to a narrow network? Uh, drastic increases in deductibles was quickly voted down. Uh, there were some other things that we considered. And, and even today, I'm thinking, well, if this doesn't go so well tonight, if not this, what? What's the plan B? Somehow we have to capture 18% because we're underfunded right now. So I appreciate that second explanation. That was very helpful and clarifying. Um, so how long, how many years has it been that there hasn't been a change? Because I think that's help, a helpful educational component too is, I mean, it really sounds like it's an overdue change. So how, is it, did you say it was like eight years or? There were eight years in a row, which represents seven changes in between those eight years. Eight years in a row where premium didn't change. Okay. And during those eight years, we also introduced the wellness benefit, which was for a family, $800 incentive if people pursued it, and a single plan, 400 And at the same time, we strengthened our plan by bringing in the high deductible plan. And if anybody says, well, it's debatable whether you strengthen the plan, if it wasn't strengthened and we maintained choice, nobody would have picked it, right? I mean, somebody picked it, so it, it was stronger for them at least. In fact, a third of our people picked it. So for a third of the people, it was a better plan. For two-thirds of the people, they experienced no change, nor any premium change. I think somewhere in that stretch, there was a $50 increase in deductibles. I don't know exactly where it is. So minimal plan design changes for all of those years, 10, 11, 11, 12. You can see the 22,804, 22,804. For eight years in a row, it was 22,804. Um, and we took money out of fund balance. And, and that was the argument that people that are currently on the plan generated that fund balance. By luck or by habits or wellness or what have you, they should benefit from it. Mm -hmm. And that's where the auditors made it easier for us because they said your fund balance is getting too high. So annual exercise, M3 would say 5% increase or 8% increase, and we'd say, well, one thing you maybe didn't consider is our fund balance. So let's allow our fund balance to take a little bit of a hit. And then we, we held on. We started in November each year saying these are some plan changes that might be imminent. But yet, okay, we didn't have, have to again for a year. Uh, so, 
So we've put this off for quite a while. And, and again, if you go back and you project perhaps a 6% increase, 6% increase, where would that employee contribution be? It would be $2,000 more than it is right now. And that's at a 6% increase, 6%, 6%. And I think mo when we talk about our high users, our people that use it a lot, I think we have to keep in mind, too, that you know, maybe there's a hypochondriac in there. Maybe there's somebody that isn't taking care of themselves as well as they should have. But most of the people that go to the doctor a lot go because they didn't pick the right parents. It's just genetics. You know, you get arthritis because it comes through your family. Or you get cancer because it runs in your family. It, it's... Sometimes I think people think about, look at the high users and, and they blame them for the cost increase and, and it's not, it's just the luck of the draw. And they're the ones that end up paying out more in their health and out of their wallet. And I think it's good to keep that in mind. So um, Bob, these are changes that are, are going to have to take a lot of education as you've already addressed mm -hmm. and I'm hopeful that we don't have this again next year with some changes. What what would have to happen for you to come back sooner than later with some significant changes? Well, being self-funded has its advantages and disadvantages. And the advantages are you can make change and see impact more quickly because it doesn't filter through an insurance company. Mm -hmm. If you reduce claims, you see those reduction in claims. And claims are claims. And high-cost claims happen. Mm -hmm. And we do have stop loss insurance to cover us on the high, high, high cost claims. But sometimes through no uh, choice of ours, we have high claims. And if we have high claims, something needs to happen. Mm -hmm. What tools are we armed with? Narrowing the network even more. Everybody's on a narrow network. High deductible for everybody. Reduced HSA contributions. Increased premium contributions, percents, increased premium dollar amounts, which we know the district has a hard time affording also. So all of the things that we've been considering, along with a couple of them on the top of that list that we didn't consider, they're always going to be in the mix. They're always going to be discussed. We're always going to be monitoring our plan to see if it's affordable. We want it to be attractive. Believe me, we really do want it to be attractive. We want it to be the best plan in town. But sometimes we can't afford it. We'll always look at those, and it's continuous. We've had some of these ideas in, in line for three or four years, mm -hmm. and thank goodness we didn't have to access them, didn't have to access them, and now we had to access several of them all in the same year. So I'm not going to say this isn't going to happen next year. Okay. Those would be things we'd have to consider. Sure. You start thinking about, about uh, state budgets, and maybe our revenue is going to start increasing a little bit more than it has in the past. These zeros couldn't have happened at a better time yeah. When you think about what was happening with our revenue limit mm -hmm. during those same years, mm -hmm. could we stomach an 8 or a 9 or 10 percent increase in our share? You can't forever, but you can occasionally if you have revenue mm -hmm. to match or if you have fund balance to match. Fortunately, we had fund balance. So I'm not going to say I'm not going to be here next year right. doing any of the same thing because, and not even self-funded. Self if you're not self-funded, you're still at the mercy of insurance companies and we could be coming back making serious plan changes there too. Mm -hmm. So when the presentation was being given, there was a, a mention about 65% um, of districts in the state offer co-insurance, and one of the questions I'm anticipating is how this plan compares to neighboring districts. Um, would you just say it's comparable? It's um, well, DCR versus the one you're <laughs> compared to. Well, we've got an expert right here. DCR versus has no HSA contribution. Nope. They have no premium. Percentage. So whatever the premium ends up being, the employee is kind of protected from that. But they also have a deductible of. I think for the family plan, it's almost six thousand dollars. So six thousand dollars. So even without coinsurance, we're st or even with coinsurance, we mm -hmm. cap out at four thousand. Sure. Okay. So they're well, deductible. <laughs> so, so it's certainly comparable uh, to DC Everest, and I think DC Everest is pretty attractive because that's just the way you know they. And when our plan right. changed, it was an abrupt shift too. I remember yeah. writing my own letter to the DC Everest yeah. school board saying, "This is not a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> change is hard." Yeah. Now I didn't want that change, but I've gotten used to it now. 
I know Annie Go has a plan that's much less attractive than ours. Mm -hmm. I'm not certain on the Merrill plan. Uh, Marshall Stevens points I'm not positive on theirs, okay. but I would think ours are getting more aligned with theirs right now. Okay. Anything else? I, can I just add, I just want to address the, uh, we were talking about the communication plan, yes. and we've already started looking at that, and I think the first thing that came to my mind is that employees learn in different ways, and yes. so we will be addressing all the different ways right. to try to address what works for them. Uh, everything from one-on-one -on -one meetings, emails that they can email a person or someone and ask what about this to group meetings mm -hmm. uh, that we mentioned earlier tonight the videos mm -hmm. uh, some people just want to read it just tell me the basics a lot of people say just tell me which one I'm supposed to choose and we can help them walk through with a flow chart of what's important to you mm -hmm. you know are premiums more important is the network more important we're going to address all of those mm -hmm. so our goal is that every person truly understands what it is and why we had to make the changes and how it will affect them. And when would that start? Pro tomorrow, okay. probably. <laughs> okay. now, now, tomorrow, the plan. Well, we don't feel comfortable going to the rest of the district until April 9th. Well, oh, we we'll we'll start working on the plan design, the plan, the plan, the plan, okay. communication yeah, what, design. What's the tomorrow. communication plan look like? How many different uh, we'll wait till the uh, modes of communication are we going to access? But, unless you feel different. Um, Aspirus also has a very um, attractive uh, implementation group mm -hmm. where they partner with us in order to deliver that message where they actually will be here with us. They will be there to meet with employees. They will be conducting the, a lot of the, the meetings and uh, it's so a, people will get the real answer and not I don't know but I'll find out exactly I'll be there exactly and that's something that we uh, when they presented to us mm -hmm. it was very attractive and what they had to deliver and okay. how they said that they would support us in uh, our communication and yeah. marketing to the employees well my concern is just that it's it's out there and it's spreading like wildfire and mm -hmm. there's concern there's the unknown factor. Um, I mean, people are, are very concerned about these numbers and don't feel educated about it. I think some people might have even reached out to you, Bob, um, just to I, try and get some answers. I think they might have reached out to me, too. Yeah, I hope I didn't, I didn't uh, scoop you on any of this, but I wanted to give enough of an answer to these people to tell mm -hmm. them kind of a quick answer, but... Mm -hmm. We still are waiting for the board to have a thorough discussion and act on this side. Mm -hmm. But I answered them enough. Well, and I, I personally appreciate that because I think when we talk about things like employee morale, treating our employees like the professionals they are, yeah. I, I, you know, I understand your hesitation because what if, yeah. but I mean, after a committee meeting, is there... <laughs> I, I've gotten in trouble for that in the past, so uh, I, I tend to not do anything until the board acts on it. Yeah. yeah. I think we have to go through the steps. We don't have anything yeah. to tell them until everything I, is official. I, I get the feeling that there are people that it's a buzz. People are talking about it, and as long as, there, as, long as there's no misinformation or false information, which there's almost bound to be no matter what, Right. There's some good in this. There are people that are tuning in tonight that maybe wouldn't be. There are people looking at board book that are asking me questions over the last few days by looking at board book. Okay, they're looking in board book. They're, mm -hmm. they're understanding. They're talking to their coworkers. Mm -hmm. uh, so I hope there's enough of a beneficial buzz about this that they come to our sessions. They read the stuff we put out. They or look at the email. Seek out a committee member. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <clears throat> so. Um, I would like to make a motion to approve the selection of Aspirus Arise slash WPS as the District Health Insurance Plan Third Party Administrator, TPA, and to accept the plan design changes for both July 1st, 2019 and January 1st, 2020 as presented. So moved. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Abstentions? You've got the... Three abstentions. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks Thank you. to the committee and everyone who worked so hard on this. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.
Moving from tier four back to tier three, there's a hole in the unintended consequence because of some changes we made to address an earlier issue, and we need to backtrack and fix this. Yes. About two years ago, I'll go back. I want to get my right documents up here because I've got a few different agenda items tonight you might have noticed. <laughs> Busy. About two years ago, we brought to you, through probably more the education department's leadership, what we needed to uh, have for teachers to show leadership. And to get in the yellow, tier four, and to stay in yellow, tier four, mm -hmm. they had to annually submit a leadership plan. And we talked a lot about what that leadership plan was and what annual obligations you had. And it was approved by the board in I think December 2016 and as part of that approval I don't know if it was in board book but it did end up being in the March uh, March it showed up on our website that if you fail to continue to uh, uh, submit your leadership plan you go back to tier 3 and in going back to tier 3 a specific box was identified like T33850, or what it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at the time, we thought, I mean, not at the time, but a month or so later, we thought, maybe that's not such a good idea. Because what if a person went from way up in purple into yellow, and then they went back to purple at the top of purple? We didn't know if that necessarily was a good idea. I'm going to show some pictures that reveal what I'm talking about. But this was the current... Uh, board action, Ed Ops, 12 19, I'm sure the very next month it got full board approval. It showed up at our website March 2017. So about two years ago, this showed up. The first year in which this happens, it means failing to complete a leadership plan. The first year it happens, get a pass. The second year it happens, go back to Tier 3. And in going back to Tier 3, go back to sell T33-3800. So if a person went from here, because remember the bold line is what you needed to achieve to get right. tier four status, along with number of academies and a leadership plan or a second master's or a PhD or what have you, they also could have gone from here actually. But if you were going from here and you came, these are the years, year one, I know that isn't the first year of their career, but let's call it year one, year one, year two, they went into the leadership tier. Year three, because they get a grace year to stay in the leadership tier. And if they then fail for a second year to not submit a leadership plan, they went back to here. And at the time, I didn't know if that was the right way to achieve a $12,000 increase. To become a leader for a moment in time. There are plenty of other moments in time that we pay attention to. When you get your master's degree, that's a moment in time. When you get a second master's, when you get national board, a lot of these things are moments in time. When you get your 10th year, moment in time. Never from the start was the yellow tier designed to be measured at a moment in time. It was designed to be, this is for leaders. And of course, measuring leadership is a whole different animal. But people were only to be leaders if they are going to stay in tier yellow. So they could have gone from here, be a leader for a moment in time, fail to be a leader a second year, get removed from Tier 4, put back into Tier 3, and benefit from that salary increase. 
and stay there for as long as they wanted to. Mm. So not too long after this was approved, we thought naming a specific box in Tier 3 was probably a bad idea. A year later, we started work with the Teacher Compensation Model Review Team. You might recall Tickmark. <laughs> teacher Compensation Model Review Team. And we met later on that year, it was in December of 2017, and the first meeting we had, we talked about this being an issue and how maybe that could be the first thing that that new group resolved. And we talked about three possible solutions. One was stay in yellow and just never move and go into yellow. One of them was go back in purple to a number no bigger than this. Well, that wasn't an issue when the yellow looked like this because these, this number was smaller than all of these. So you're always going back to a smaller number. And then the third one that got the most support, it still wasn't unanimous support, was go back to the purple tier and get the benefit of the number of years and the number of professional development points you had taken since you were last in purple. For example, if they gave up 300 points by going back to yellow, let's put them back in purple as if they had the 300 points back. Maybe they even earned some new points while they were in yellow. Award those points. They earned them. They're entitled to them. So last year we added some more yellow. It was about this time last year. I remember it well. Dr. Hiltz was in the audience. Right? And it was a long board meeting. And we talked about adding some purple down here, but adding some yellow in increments. We were going to add two more yellow, add two more yellow, add three more yellow. And you might remember the motivation was nobody should go from 58,000 to 72,000 in one year. Not that we don't like that, but it takes away from everybody else. And that would be $14,000 that we could spend on a lot of different people. So that was the motivation a year ago in building up the yellow. Now, this box is not smaller than all of these. Think about when this plan was created, you were always going back to a lower salary because that's lower than everything in yellow. So now there's more of a need to address this. Under the current plan, you would go from here to here, a moment in time be a leader, maybe longer, but perhaps only a moment in time, and then launch forward to this. And that same increase, spending two years here. And we don't think that's right. This is the first time it's proposed. This is current arrangement, current arrangement with the additional yellow. This is proposed. And proposed would be, you live here, you go into yellow, you maybe spend two years there, maybe you spend three years there. I've got another slide that shows you there for many years. Here's where it gets a little bit tough to track, but we think it's fair. We add up the points that you would have earned or would have had if you would have not gone yellow at all. And we award you those points in the purple tier. In this case, year one, year two, year three, somewhere they got 50 points. Maybe they gave them back, maybe they earned them while they were in yellow, they should be awarded those 50 points and be given one vertical move. It becomes more obvious that that's maybe the right thing to do when you look at somebody that's been there for several years. Year one, two, three, four, five, six, go back to seven. Current. With the new yellow, one, two, three, four, five, six, you go back to seven. What that committee, Teacher Compensation Model Review Team Committee felt was fair, not unanimously, because there were three solutions being considered at the time. And to be honest, the, the, the vibe in the room was, we'll get to that when it gets to be a problem. Well, let's get to it before it's a problem. Under what's being proposed, one, two, three, four, five, six. During those years, I know for sure they earned 50 points, 50, they earned for sure 150. That's how they got these vertical moves. They might have earned more than that, because they might have given some points back when they went to yellow. So it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis. Based on number of years and number of points, we put them there in their seventh year. One, two, three, four, they moved three verticals and they ended up there. So the wording, which is tough, this is where lawyers come in handy, but I'm not one and I did my best. Okay, instead of returning to the highest salary in Tier 3, 
Returning, placement in Tier 3 will be based on the most recent position in Tier 3 with vertical and horizontal advancement applied as if Tier 2 move had never occurred. Example, all applicable credentialing years and PD points will be applied to the previous Tier 3 placement to determine the new placement in Tier 3. <clears throat> so that yellow was never designed for everybody to go into it. That's the leader category. And what we're trying to avoid is somebody getting into that leader category and then colliding. Life, life happens. They get ill. A, a parent gets ill. They can't fulfill what they needed. We thought of all kinds of scenarios where you just can't finish your leadership program. Or they just don't enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, or they're burnt out from it, exactly. Mm -hmm. And here we're creating a, a way to, to go back and hold them harmless, so to speak. Sure. What if you wouldn't have been, you know, you've got money in the bank for when you were in yellow, of mm -hmm. course. You were a leader. You have access to higher salaries while sure. you're a leader. If you choose not to be a leader, we'll wait another year until it's a second year, mm -hmm. and then we'll put you back as if you maybe never made that decision to begin with. And you still have the benefit of maybe a one, two, or three thousand dollar one time bonus. Yeah. These teachers do get a two thousand dollar one time bonus. Because remember from last year, when we built up this yellow, mm -hmm. we moved people's cheese, and mm -hmm. the more we moved it, the bigger one time bonus. How many times do they get to coast? Can they coast one year, put in the leadership plan, coast the next year, put in the leadership plan? Twice? Two mm -hmm. years. And that's, that's it. So with this uh, coasting, as Jane refers to it, it, it are, are the teachers on notice? Do they get some kind of yeah. letter that you, you have not done what you were supposed to this year? If it's Absolutely. not done next year? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I'll let the education department speak to that because it's certainly the yeah. case. Sure, and I'll start and Chris will get out if you'd like. Um, there has been um, one or more situations where we have had somebody who has a proposal leadership plan but throughout the year in check-ins with their principal and or members of the education department, maybe not feeling like it was the right plan for them, and so then we revisit them, we help them to rewrite it. I myself have met with people multiple times, one-on-one -on -one with a principal. We do everything we can to make sure they're comfortable and they really do feel confident in being able to lead the plan that they create. So we work very closely with them. Okay, so there's there's no no surprises, right? No, absolutely. Okay, and in fact, sometimes it's a member of our department actually reaching out to say we haven't had a check in. We didn't reckon, you know, we recognize maybe a date was on the calendar for them to leave something and they weren't in a class. So we've even been known to be proactive and call them or ask if they would like to meet with us. And sometimes it's very much appreciated because they maybe didn't even know that they should be doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, absolutely. And Thank certainly you. an opportunity to even revise or shift the focus yes. of the sure. leadership plan if indeed they determine this is not the path that they choose to lead mm -hmm. further. Mm -hmm. okay. Do we have any evidence that this $14,000 a year extra pay that they're earning is giving us $14,000 extra month in our classrooms? That's a topic for a different time. <laughs> <laughs> That's a topic for when Dr. Hiltz is here. Yeah, I mean, I. I don't want to get but too far in the weeds. I can understand we aren't going to discuss it, but I want it out on the table because it's, okay. it's a part of this. We, we talk about that often, okay. about if we're putting all the dollars in the right spot and giving mm -hmm. student impact with it. Because as you've all heard me say, like a broken record, when this plan was proposed, it was proposed that there would be an outside funding stream to help fund it. It would not be taken from our other staff to fund it. So, Bob, I know you mentioned that uh, you're not an attorney, but I, I, I want to commend you on your language here because when you were presenting this, um, I teach contract law, and what I was thinking about was both reliance damages and restitution damages, which put the individual back in the position they would have been if the contract had never been formed, depending on the party, and that's essentially what, what's happening here. Yeah, so, so that's, that that's exactly the language that I use. That's how I explain it to my students. <laughs> yeah, Bob, I, it, it makes sense. I get it. I understand why we have to do it. Um, I still can't believe we actually paid somebody to help us come up with this plan. But that's a topic for another day. I was just going to say that, but you beat me to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Well, we knew that we knew the plan was going to go through a little bit of evolution. <coughs> continues to go through evolution. Mm -hmm. So nobody in the room where we built it thought it was going to be it forever. Mm -hmm. uh, so these things are inevitable. We have seen fewer and fewer of them as we go. Okay. Anybody else <laughs> would seek a motion to approve the change in language regarding teachers returning from Tier 4 to Tier 3 in the compensation model as presented, exactly the way you laid it out. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? <coughs> Motion carries. And I would, I think that's everything. I would seek a motion to adjourn. We're not doing the whole child thing? No, he's gone. No, oh, he's okay. gone. So moved. So we'll Second. Second. Oh. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries.